So, uh, uh, can you hear me? Good morning. I, um, well, I, I'm going to talk to, to this morning about the, the, the history of the RIPRA project, uh, which actually started as a project to, uh, to make self-copying machines and ended up to, to be uh, like the, 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 the ecosystem, uh, the, the mother of all the low-cost 3D printers in the world now. So it's got a, an, an evolution and a, a diffusion all over the world. And uh, I'm, I'm one of the, of the many hundreds people actively working working, working uh, playing every day uh, through the internet and without ever uh, meeting physically together uh, but sharing designs and technical information and knowledge and ideas to, to develop these machines. Uh, so uh, I, I gave my contribution on the software side myself uh, but I'm going to talk about the whole project this morning. Let's see if this works. Yes. So everything started uh, in in the Bath University in uh, Great Britain uh, with the goal of making a replicated rapid prototyper project. Uh, Bath is over there, and uh, the the idea. Uh, uh, we have to say thanks for this idea to uh, Dr. Adrian Bauer, uh, who had uh, some, uh, uh, s s some visions about um, making a, a machine that would be able to make most of the parts to build another similar machine. Uh, and he actually had more uh, than just an idea of a, a machine to make things. Uh, he, he had the idea of making an uh, um, a live machine, a machine that could uh, be uh, modified and uh, um, improved by people uh, like for example happened in, in biology evolution and uh, one of his principles uh, was that uh, the uh, availability of such machines would uh, allow people to print parts for other machines, uh, thus starting an, an exponential uh, process of replication of these machines. Because if I have a machine, I can print parts from, for my friends, I have 10 friends, and so on. So uh, this actually happened. So we are here with, uh, with machines, with more machines that uh, any single factory could have produced. Uh, uh, another uh, principle was that um, these machines would be uh, subject to uh, spontaneous evolution. I have an, an open machine. I can uh, try to improve the problems, I can to put my own ideas into it, and then other people will build their own on my ideas. I take what I like, I uh, take out what I don't like about this machine. So we, we can see here uh, 10 uh, machines which are all different. Uh, they almost do like the same thing, but they are very different in the solutions, in the structure, in materials, in electronics. Uh, so uh, this is a living machine. And uh, uh, his third idea was to uh, was to start a uh, um, uh, actually uh, to, to, to allow people to um, uh, to make goods useful goods uh, without uh, needing uh, the whole industrial process. Uh, so. Um, uh, the, the start of a customizable manufacturing where uh, uh, each person can be uh, the author of his objects. So uh, this is, well, his, his final vision, but uh, this is probably the one that <coughs> is least easy that will happen. So uh, he built a, uh, a small team working with him. Uh, this is the original team physically located in the University of Bath uh, in the first times. Uh, if we were to, um, uh, to, to draw a line uh, that describes the process of, um, of uh, designing and making a self-copying machine, a self-replicating machine, so through the, uh, the, the full replicability goal, and we would have a first goal about replicability of frame components, so uh, vertices to build the structure, for example. A, another goal uh, would be the replicability of mechanical components, so gears, uh, couplers. Um, uh, another goal would be to, to print belts. Another goal would be to a machine that would be able to print its own electronic boards. 
Uh, actually, what happened is partially uh, uh, what you see here, because we got until near here, and then the availability of, of this machine turned out into something different. So uh, actually nobody tried to, 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 di to do these things, but we, 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 now, we now have a, a machine that can do almost any kind of objects regardless of them being useful for the machine itself. So we could probably rephrase this, the description of reprob machines to, to something else like a general purpose open rapid prototyping machine or something like that. So the goal is not just about self-coping, self-replicating. We, we, you can see here machines that are made of wood, of metal, of, they, they use industrial electronics. Uh, so uh, as you see, we, uh, the goal is slightly different. Mm. The, the technology that all of these machines use is the so-called FDM, which is the process of making objects by uh, melting thermoplastics and layer by layer and building objects this way. Uh, this was the, uh, the best compromise between uh, ease of, um, of, of building these machines, uh, costs and um, avoiding the problems of toxicity, of powders, of resins, and also this technology allows to make uh, uh, robust mechanical parts. So this was the original choice. Uh, actually, I have to, I have to, uh, to say that FDM is a trademark expression by Stratasys Corporation. So the Repra project actually invented another definition, which is um, almost the same uh, equ equivalent, but uh, it's a it's a different way of saying the same thing, which is not covered by trademark. So uh, I tend to use FFF everywhere, uh, like all the community does. Uh, well, I'm, I'm going to show you the first experiment and the history from, from, the, beginning, from the beginning to these days. Um, they started with syringe pumps and, and then uh, went on to, to trying uh, plastic filaments uh, with the screw extruders. Um, and then um, they tried to, to build uh, rotary tables. Uh, to make circular objects, and these were the first results. Uh, and then they started uh, evolving the machine mechanics uh, without the rotary tables and making Cartesian robots to have a free positioning on the three axes. Uh, and then they started uh, building such machines. Basically, it's a CNC machine with an extruder applied as the, in, the, in the tool uh, position. Uh, until they got to, to some nearly working prototypes. Uh, uh, these parts you see are printed on, were printed on professional 3D printers they had in the university. So these, are, these were the first experiments about printable el electronics. You, you could uh, deposit some conductive material and make your own boards. And then you, you, know, you know what's happened. This is today. This is uh, what, what you can uh, see in this lab, for example. Functional objects, uh, wooden prints, uh, any kind of, of replicas, any kind of, uh, of models for education, for art, and me mechanical parts, working parts for drones, for example, uh, and um, any kind of toys, uh, very small prints, and multicolor prints, we will talk about multicolor prints uh, in the next days, and the architectural models, and the. Uh, and even, this is me looking at myself printed. This is a 3D scan with low cost, almost free technologies. We will assess, I think this will be discussed in the next days with free, free applications or low, very low cost applications for 3D scanning too. Uh, we, we now have lots of materials. We have a com a competition in the market uh, in, uh, about f in, in the field of filament producers. Uh, a new 3D printing economy started actually uh, and uh, it is made of filament manufacturers, electronic manufacturers and mechanical components manufacturers for people who want to build their own 3D printers at home and they uh, still uh, prefer to buy some pre-assembled components uh, if they do not have machines for, for making metal parts for example. Uh, 
there are printer vendors who print kits or pre-assembled printers. Uh, there are courses. Uh, there are even shops. There are shops in the, the most mm, famous one is in New York City, but we have shops in Italy too now. So it's a uh, uh, it's, it's a real new economy around the uh, 3D printing. But all, I have to say that all low-cost FFF printers are based on wrap-wrap designs. So even if they do not claim to be wrap-wrap printers, because they are not open anymore, they do not follow open licensing, for example, they are usually in, they are using the work of the community uh, in, uh, made in these years. So all low-cost filament printers are based on riprap. Uh, there, are no, there is no technical difference between riprap printers and other low-cost uh, filament printers, low-cost printers. Uh, they all use the same technology. They may vary about dimension, about uh, electronics, about mm, frame, but they use almost the same technology. So even the claims about, uh, hey, my machine is more precise than yours. It's just a matter of how calibrated one machine is, uh, how much time was spent on that machine to, to reach a calibration. But the technology is almost the same. Uh, when, when you find an offer for an, an assembled low-cost 3D printer, like an appliance that you can plug to the socket and start printing, you are building a pre-assembled and branded RepRap printer. Basically, uh, the Ripra project <laughs> itself today uh, has evolved since then. There are no more official printer designs. We will go through what, uh, the, the first official designs back in the days uh, released by the Repra project. But now there is no, uh, no central uh, guidance for the project, so there are no official designs. There are no official goals. <coughs> Uh, everyone works on what they like to, to, to play with. But the Repro project is, is very alive. We have hundreds or even more uh, variations and designs of printers. Like every rep wrapper has its own design at home. And uh, uh, we have thousands of, of active members uh, talking all the day and working all the day. And it's actually an active collaborative research project. Uh, so perhaps it's not a project anymore, we could say that it's a movement, you could say that it's an ecosystem, a community, better, better said it's a community. If, if you go to the official RepRap website, it's a wiki, uh, not even the wiki is able to collect all the, all the things that happen in the community, so even the website is not representative of what the project is uh, nowadays. Uh, the, uh, the project, the community works around um, mainly two channels of communication. One is the IRC chat channel. Uh, that's where most of the development happens all the day. If you if we, if we connect right now to the to the channel, we would see it's hundreds of people talking and, and and exchanging ideas and helping out each other. The other place is the forums. These are the two places where the RepRap community works together. This is a family tree. Uh, made by someone who uh, was tired to, to expand and get in one year ago, so <laughs> this is not updated anymore since April of the last year. But you can see the, the evolution until one year ago, and I think we, uh, we couldn't, couldn't even able to, to compile an updated version. So from the first working versions in, uh, uh, well, uh, actually some years ago, and not many years ago, actually, and this is what we had one year ago with a, an explosion of variations where everybody took the, some parts and threw out some other parts. So, uh, one of the core members uh, proposed this definition by doing an analogy with uh, uh, biological processes, uh, like a comparison of the initial official designs uh, made by the core team and what the community actually uh, was able to, to produce spontaneously. Open hardware. RipRap is a open hardware. You have all the designs for each hardware part of the machine, electronics, mechanics. You can, you can uh, modify them because you have the sources. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a live process. Uh, the, uh, the research, actually, these variations happens, happen along many, many, many directions. Uh, 
frame is one of these. You, you, you find 10 different kinds of frames, uh, box frames, vertical frames, uh, um, wedge frames, we will, we will see them uh, later. Another direction of, uh, of uh, uh, research is the mechanics. Uh, we have Cartesian robots, we have Delta robots, we, have, we will see them. Uh, we have printable materials, they are, they are varying uh, very, very, very fast. Uh, in, the, in these months, uh, we have new materials, elastic materials, uh, conducting materials, uh, electronics in, a, in the, another uh, direction of uh, uh, research. So the software side of 3D printing is another important part of, uh, of research. And the software part is made of firmware, which is the part which resides on the machine itself, and the, CA, the CAM part, which is located on the computer. This was the first working printer. The Darwin printer, uh, it worked. It actually worked. Uh, it was quite solid. <laughs> and the, the first parts were printed with a professional Stratasys machine available at the, at the university. But this only was needed for the first one. After you got the first one, you can continue uh, with the machine itself. These are the parts that, that are needed to make the, the, the frame machine. And then you need to add some other parts called vitamins. So when a machine self-replicates, it makes plastic parts. Then you need some vitamins to, have, to help it grow. This was the idea. Uh, so this is a, a set of parts for, build, for building a derby machine. Until one day, the first, uh, <laughs> the first time, uh, this thing happened and, and a professional machine was not need, needed anymore. This, this picture is very famous. Uh, uh, another very famous picture was this one. This one made the Repra project very, very famous back in the days because the idea of downloading a pair of shoes and printing them and using them uh, actually uh, showed the, 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 the power of the project. I'll now show some images of the original experiments. This is how an extruder worked and actually how it works uh, today. Uh, experiments with, uh, with ball, ball chains instead of belts to, to, to find cheaper alternatives to belts. Uh, variations with ac acrylic cut um, frames and uh, acrylic extruders and uh, the the first dedicated electronic boards, rep wrap board. And this is the way uh, vi vitamins are added uh, to, to the printed parts to make functional parts. This is uh, how the first extruders worked. Filament is pushed down to the, to the hot end and then printed. Basically, it's a, it's a resistance wrapped around the, the barrel. It's a nichrome wire uh, to which power is applied and you get heat uh, on the barrel. Uh, then, uh, the, 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 the second evolution was the Mendel printer. The idea of um, uh, simplifying the motion by having the, the bed moving in one direction and the extruder moving on the other axis. Uh, so the, the the concept of the sprinter uh, led to the first working uh, prototypes. These are some uh, bottom views. And this is a comparison of the Darwin printer and the metal printer, which is simplified, so less plastic parts, uh, easier, easier to build, but still a lot more difficult than current printers. And, uh, actually almost the same printable area. This is a comparison of uh, the savings on structural component components and costs. Uh, some ideas for, for what <laughs> some years ago became uh, those large printers. And uh, th this was developed as part of a uh, PhD thesis of Ed Sells, member of the core team. Uh, and this was the final cells Mendel. 
This is the distribution of costs of the sales mantle. You can, you can, you can see how non-principal parts are actually the most, uh, the, 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 the main components. Acrylic variations. And then uh, we are going to see what variations uh, each of these two original designs uh, produced. The Darwin was, uh, was, uh, was, has been, since then, the basis for many commercial variants of printers. One of the first was the BFB uh, models. Uh, they basically simplified and the, the Darwin printer, they, they used multiple extruders. MakerBot, the, the, the very famous MakerBot printer, this one. Uh, started as a variation of the of the Darwin design with a with a moving table, and this quickly until nowadays. Of course, this is what Mac MakerBot sells today. Uh, other printers like ShaperCube, uh, a detail of a ShaperCube with two extruders. Uh, Ultimaker, we, I see a couple of Ultimakers over there. They are based on the same Darwin design many years after. Uh, a, a very tall Mendel. Uh, somebody tried to print all the frames, so these are all printed tiles. It took a lot to print this one. Uh, and then we have the, the variations of the Mendel design. For example, a plywood laser cut one, an acrylic one. Uh, and a one made of injection molded parts, which is a technique for make uh, parts uh, more quickly. Uh, wooden uh, variations of the of the Mendel, Lego bricks, <laughs> and, and then uh, one day, uh, th this guy, this young guy, he was 20, 21 years old. Uh, he he proposed his Mendel the Prusa Mendel, named after uh, his name. Uh, the Prusa Mendel is a, is a lot simplified Mendel design with, uh, with some new ideas, for example, uh, to use printed bushings instead of brass bushings, for example, which were used previously. Uh, if, you, if you print bushings with PLA, you get very smooth movement. They probably wear out faster than uh, uh, brass bushings, but they still work, so it's a simplification and uh, clean design and uh, way, uh, a lot of, uh, of bolts, of uh, fasteners were removed from the design, so you needed way less parts. This is a, a set of parts to build the Prusa Mendel. If you remember the, 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 the previous images, this is uh, less, much, much less, less than half a kilogram. And then you need to buy smooth rods, uh, and, uh, and threaded rods and make two, uh, uh, the, the two frames. Then you need to add some motors. Then you need to, to buy uh, bells and pulleys. And you have your Prusa Mendel. The Prusa Mendel has been the, the most famous printer in the world for years. Uh, um, economy, an economy started uh, on Prusa Mendel printers way before then 3D printing itself. Um, it, it, it's, it's still, I think, the most uh, used printer in the world because it's very low cost and easy to assemble. And then it started its own variations. So, for example, um, larger, larger versions. This is even larger. And the Christmas variations. And the uh, lighter frame parts with hollowed out parts for easier printing. Optimized designs, basically. Uh, for example, this is a, a, an optimized version of the Prusa Mendel. And uh, people started to use uh, metal cheap bearings um, for motion, which is a good compromise between price, availability, and uh, smoothness of movement. This is from the bottom. 
then uh, somebody tried to uh, to print the old frame for this too, reducing the need for more threaded rods. And then this is the Mendel Max. Mendel Max is a is a variation of the Prusa Mendel, which uses. Uh, Extru uh, aluminium extrusions instead of the threaded rods commonly available from uh, hardware stores. Th these ones are, are not so commonly available but you can find them on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the internet and for example that larger printer is a larger Mendel Max if you want to see how a Mendel Max is, is made of. It's a very uh, sturdy frame. And then this is a very recent uh, area of, of research which is a Basically, the replacement of Cartesian robots with uh, Delta robots. You save one motor with these printers. You need four motors instead of five. Uh, you, you, you can have tall printers, you can have very fast vertical movement. Actually, we do not need fast vertical movements in these printers. But perhaps we could use this and develop software that can use uh, the, the fact that these printers can move vertically very fast. They are nice to see when printing, because they are like spiders. This is how they work with universal joints on the carriage. Even very tall variations of the Delta robots. <laughs> and then vertical frame printers is another kind of frames. I think we have a couple of those printers that, there. This is uh, uh, the last idea of Joseph Prusa. Do you remember the author of the Prusa Mendel? Uh, this is the evolution. He, he, he basically tried uh, to find a new compromise between uh, self-replicability of the printer and costs and actual uh, appeal, appeal of the printer. Joseph says, why does open source software and hardware have to be so ugly? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can make open machines that are also pleasant to see and robust and not, uh, not so fragile to, to move, to touch, to transport. So this is his last design. Uh, I like this very much because uh, it, it's, it's a very compact printer which can print 20, 20 and 20 centimeters uh, build volume. Then other printers were designed with the uh, goal of uh, being foldable. You can fold this, this printer and grab it with you. And uh, this is a larger one. This is a, a recent design, the TK0. You can fold the, the y-axis and transport this printer. And then there is another area uh, about transportable printers, uh, little printers, because many times you, you, you print little objects and you do not need uh, a 20 centimeter uh, build plate, you need less. So this is uh, the, the proposal of the, co of, the, of the RepRap core team. So this is the third and last official RepRap design, the Huxley printer. Uh, and this was a printable, a portable printer. This was the, the parts made of, uh, needed to build the printer. This is a mini Mendel Max printer. This is the Tantillus, fully printable. Uh, this is an, uh, a live project. You can download the files and build it yourself. It's very, uh, very famous. This is my proposal for uh, for mini printers. Basically, it's a mini i3 printers printer. Uh, and then uh, we are now going to see some uh, details of the hot ends. So th this is the one of the of the first uh, examples of hot ends. Basically, it's a, a a threaded uh, rod or a bolt machined on, on the top with a hole inside and with nichrome wire wrapped around it and power applied. So this is what you need to extrude filament. Filament is pushed from here. This is insulation, thermal insulation to avoid melting the plastic parts of the, of the printer. Uh, this is a, another, another idea where you don't use uh, nichrome wire wrapped around the barrel, but you use a resistor inside this block, a power resistor. These are more complex variations. This is a Hungarian 
uh, hot end. This is another another proposal for a hot end where you can replace the nozzle if you want a, a different tip size. <coughs> you can just unscrew this and replace it with, an, with another one. This is currently the most popular because it's very cheap. It costs less than 50 euros. And uh, it's, it's, it's machined out of a single block of peak. Uh, it's CNC machined. Uh, and this is very popular because it works and it's cheap and really available. This is uh, another idea from Joseph Prusa and of an, uh, um, steel, uh, stainless steel uh, barrel and this is, this is able to print um, materials at higher temperature. This can reach uh, more than 300 degrees while, for example, the previous one, the melting point of this material is at 248 degrees. So, you, for example, you cannot print polycarbonate, you cannot print uh, some kind of nylons, you cannot print, uh, um, well, other, other new materials that, requires high, that require high temperature. This is also food safe, <coughs> being stainless steel. Uh, this is the part that pushes no, well, sorry. That pushes the filament from he coming from here inside the barrel. So it's the way of coupling the motor to the, to, to the filament. This is the original proposal, the original extruder, called the Wade extruder. The name uh, comes from the, the user who designed it, actually. Uh, you take a, a bolt, you, you machine it to make some teeth. Hobbit bolt. Whoops. This is a uh, the, the the current the currently most used design. I, I think those printers use this this kind of extruder, which is accessible. It's easy to to clean. You see what happens inside. Uh, this is uh, an, another kind of uh, of extrusion drive mechanism called Bowden extruder. If you, if you see, this is the drive which is uh, attached to the frame and then filament is pushed inside a tube and then it comes out on the, uh, on the hot end over there, so it's far from the, from the hot end. It's like, a, uh, it's like the, 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 the Bowden mechanism on, on the back, for example, on a brake. It's about like a Bowden brake. So uh, it has some problems because filament is elastic. So if I push it from here, uh, it takes some time for it to decompress on the other side. So there is a delay, uh, pressure problems, and these are difficult to model by software. So you have, you have to print very fast and very constant speed. You can stop, otherwise you, can, you will get uh, not uniform results on print. And then chocolate extrusion. <laughs> And uh, with, with syringe pumps, basically this is a, this is a syringe with a, a belt uh, all over it. The motor just uh, pulls the belt and the syringe extrudes material. You can use this technique for ceramics, for um, sugar, for um, many other kinds of materials. Uh, research is being done also on multiple extruders. This is a printer with two heads with alternating material. Software controls when to use one, when to use the other one. Uh, there are some problems. Uh, for example, when one extruder is not being used, it produces some plastic coming in excess from it. So it, you could, can end up with dirty prints. So this is something which is being researched on. This is, these are other ap applications of the of the um, uh, ability to print with multiple materials, which, me which means multiple colors, for example, or using the second material for support structures. You can use uh, some uh, material that is easy to, to remove after the print uh, and get the support for overhanging parts. We will talk about this kind of techniques tomorrow. Um, this is an example of a triple Bowden extruder machine. These are here, and then they go on the carriage. This is another variation. These are 
three extruders on the carriage, but they all push into a single nozzle. So this is a mixing extruder. Uh, in theory, you could make any colors by mixing original colors. This is how it works. Uh, in practice, there are problems because mixing is not perfect and there is a huge delay between the time when you start pushing a new uh, material inside and what you get outside. It comes out like toothpaste with stripes, so we, we need to work a lot more on this. But the, the idea is very good. Um, another, another branch is, is the one about electronics. Uh, this is a basic electronic kit. Uh, you, you can buy such a kit from, from eBay nowadays. You get five motors, five because you have X motor, Y motor, and then usually you have two motors for Z, uh, which, which is better than using a single one and then a, a belt, and then a fifth motor, motor for the extruder. Then you get a um, Arduino board and the rest. Basically, this is the most common setup. There is an Arduino mega board. I, I think most of you know what Arduino is. Arduino is a, is a commonly available and cheap prototyping board. You buy it for, for less than 50 euros. You can put software on it, it's a microcontroller, and then you work with input and output pins on it. So it's the perfect prototyping platform for 3D printers too, because you have lots of pins. You apply the RAMS board on it. This, is, uh, this, was, des this was designed for 3D printers specifically, and then you apply uh, four motor drivers on it, in this place. So it's like a sandwich of multiple layers. Uh, this is another popular electronics, electronic board. This is very cheap. This is an all-in-one board, Sanguino Lolu. So you do not need a separate Arduino board and a shield on it. It's all-in-one. It's very cheap. Uh, and then there are variations of the Sanguino Lolo. Uh, this is the printer board, still based on the same chip architecture, which is the ATML chip inside, so it's compatible with the same firmware. This is the Rambo board, same thing. It's basically like a RAMS board with the Arduino chip, which is an ATML, on board. So you do not need a separate board. It's all in one. This is the only available design that you can make yourself at home with a breadboard or any other kind of electronics prototyping techniques. So if you really want to build everything from scratch, you use this one. This is a new, a new electronic board. This uses a, a different uh, architecture because it's an ATML chip with a RM architecture. So you need new software for this one. Uh, this is a very good board with thermal, with a good thermal design. This is another new generation board. It's a Cortex ARM architecture, very powerful. You can put an Ethernet plug on it. Uh, you can write software to have a web server on it and control the printer from web. So this is evolution, and, and this is still all. This is still open hardware. You have the designs of this of this board. You can download the design, see how it works, modify it, and even sell your variations if you respect the license. Uh, heated bed is uh, the the hot platform that uh, allows to print uh, easily uh, large objects or to. Uh, avoid sticking problems. One of the most common problems is the adhesion of uh, things on the plate. Things tend to, to detach when, while you print. So uh, Joseph Prusa had this idea, well he had lots of, uh, of genial ideas <laughs> in this project. The idea of making a PCB board, it's like a, this, uh, an electronic circuit board. It's PCB with a, with a very long trace. Let me see if, okay, it's on the other side, so trust me. On the other side you would see a very long trace, so you apply power on the two end, end, end points and basically you get power, you get thermal power. And this is a very common solution. This is how it's usually mounted on a printer. You have a sandwich of uh, uh, of the of the. Um, uh, okay, you see the traces here, and this is glass put on it to get a flat surface because PCB tends to deform, to warp. Uh, this is another way of making a heated bed yourself. You take an aluminium plate, you put resistors in it, 
and you still get something that gets hot. Uh, probably it gets uh, less uniformly hot. It will be more hot here and less here, for example. Uh, but it, it will still work. This is another, uh, an, another technique for making uh, uh, heat, heated beds. These are copper traces inside a sandwich of two Captain adhesive uh, sheets. So this is very light. You can then glue this to an aluminum plate. These are very small, very small 10, 10 by 10 uh, plates that, that, I, that, I, um, that I manufactured for the mini printer I showed you before. I needed a heated bed. I'm done uh, in advance, so if you have any questions, I'm here. The price range. Yes. Uh, there are basically uh, three three steps. Uh, one step, the, the 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 first step is you source all parts by yourself. If you really want to, to to save on money and you order motors, you order belts, you order any kind of component, and you have your friends printing your plastic parts, you you if you are lucky and if you are a good buyer, you could save and spend no more than 400 euros, even less. But you have to find the right suppliers, you have to, to have the, your mind clear about what you need to buy, because sometimes you buy uh, 100 components on the internet, you try them and they're not compatible, so you have to buy them twice. So you, it's not very easy. Another step is to buy a kit, a, a kit where a company puts everything in a, in a box, and you pay, uh, of course, the fact that you are getting uh, everything in a box. Uh, it's, comp it's compatible for sure. You have instructions, and you pay uh, between 600 and 900 usually. Uh, and the third step is assembled printers. Uh, assemb an assembled printer costs uh, more than 1,000 and 12,000, uh, 1,200, uh, 12, uh, 12, sorry, 1,200 euros usually. This is the, the the basic price for assembled printers, but they, for example, a maker, but costs way more than 1,200. What about yours? You print that? How much? Is it? I'm not selling anything. <laughs> I just re <laughs> <laughs> I release the design, so you can make yourself by downloading the design, and I'm not selling anything. And it works with which, which plastic? Uh, all, all these printers will work with almost any plastics, speaking of the basic plastics. PLA, ABS and PVA are the most common. Uh, I mean the diameter? Uh, yes, um, these are open machines so you can put any kind of extruder on any kind of machine. So the, the diameter is usually 3 millimeters. There are also printers uh, using, uh, I don't think here there are printers using uh, 1.75 millimeters filament, but they usually use the 3 millimeters one, and, the, and then you can exchange the nozzle orifice for the, the printing quality. How much temperature it dries, it gets into the student region? Yeah, it depends on the material. Uh, temperatures range from 170 to 300. It depends on the material. Uh, PLA, uh, I didn't talk about materials, I probably talk, will talk about those tomorrow, but I think other talks will, 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 will talk about materials. But PLA uh, needs up to 200, 210 degrees. ABS needs slightly more, up to 250. And then there are those new materials, elastic materials, polycarbonate, they need up to 300. Oh, PEAK is another printable material. Uh, peak is the one, the rigid plastic. We we saw um, the black one of the hot end of the of the one block hot end. That is printable. The problem is we don't have spools of peak. But okay, yes. yes. What about the size of the pieces that you can print? Uh, you can print almost any size, in theory. The problem is if you go up to uh, with your sides, you have no problems about almost no problems about mechanics. Uh -huh. But you have problems about time, required time for a print. Uh, those are very large printers, but I, I think even we'll talk about the problems of printing for three days or four days, and it's very risky. What happens if, if you lose electricity power? Problem, uh, and, and these are other kind of problems of warping. There are thermal problems. Uh, 
print has cooling as non-uniform cooling uh, because some parts cool before and others cool later and some materials like ABS uh, are suffer from shrinkage so this this is you see uh, crackles on the side and you also have to fight another problem which is horizontal warping on the plane it tends to curl up so this is the kind of problems it's not a mechanical problem Uh, my, my, my hint is to buy a kit. It, it's the best compromise. A kit has a good price usually. You, you, you pay two, three hundred more than self-sourcing your parts, but you have instructions. You, you, you don't lose six months trying to, run, to get your printer up and running. But some people have economical problems in different countries. Okay. Uh, in, in, this case, the, in this case, I could recommend books, for example, I could recommend internet website with tutorials. There are basically a lot and I cannot recommend a single one. I can recommend the main thing which is get in touch with the community. If you uh, take your laptop and now connect to the IRC channel, RepRap channel on Freenode Network, in this moment you will find tens of, per of people happy to help you uh, find parts in your parts of the world. Uh, and give you hints. It's the best way to, to get someone helping you interactively. It builds up a team, for example, or maybe you're talking about selling those parts to other, yes, to put them online. It's, it's, a, it's a usual way of self-funding the, the, the printer. You have a printer running and then you start printing parts for other printers, you put them on eBay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you, it's a usual way to, to, to get money back. Yes, yes. Any question? You mentioned these heated beds. The only reason why you need them is basically a temperature homogeneity? Or no, or actually, uh, they are not necessary uh, in all situations. You can get rid of them. Also, they, uh, uh, they use like 80% of the power of a printer. So uh, you can basically cut your power needs down from uh, 400 watts from 90 watts. So it, if, if you can re get rid of a heated bed, it's best for you. But it's very useful for fighting warping problems, for example, if you have a very large ABS part, it will tend to curl up. And you have to fight this in, with many techniques. I will talk about some of these tomorrow. There are things you can, uh, you can put on your print surface. Uh, there are other you, you can, treatments that you can, uh, for example, you can send your, your glass bed. A heated bed is the quickest one. You, get, you keep everything hot so the object stays uh, attached. Uh, did I answer to your question? So it's basically temperature machine. Uh, yes, it's for, getting the, uh, for keeping the object attached to the print surface and avoiding the, the warping. I will have a clear picture about what happens with warping tomorrow. To, to make them yourself, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, you could just take a... You need, for example, a drill. You, you, you take a block and you, and you, yeah, and you, well, and you cut a hole. Yeah, and what's, like, what's the smallest size? Uh, uh, you, you, can, you can go down to 0 0.3. You could go even lower, but it's, not, it's worthless. So you need an 0 0.3, 0 0.35 millimeters drill bit to make that, that bit. Um, 
which is only on the tip. Then you need three millimeters inside the, the barrel because it's where the plastic hasn't melted yet. So it, it's before it gets hot, then it's like a funnel inside. Uh, you, you can do that with a drill, with a, with a press drill. With a, it's, it's probably the, the cheapest way and easiest uh, way to, to make the part. There are, there are designs uh, uh, for, for that on the internet, there are tutorials, and again, there is a large community of people, of people enjoying to do these things uh, without buying pre-assembled pre components. And, uh, the entrance, the, the threaded rod? Yeah, because that's also <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what's the best material. You just get mild steel or the, the hardened steel. Um, any kind of, of steel, uh, of course, uh, aluminium, for example, for steel rods would work, but it probably goes to, it wears out quick, quickly, it's cheaper though. But for threaded rods, yes, you, you, you need steel. But you need a, any kind, of, uh, any kind of, of cheap threaded rods, even not for mechanical precision. Uh, because uh, uh, actually, the, ver the vertic, the straightness of the movement is not given by the precision of the threads or the straightness of the threaded rods. It's given by the smooth rod, which is on the side. Uh, so you can even use a, a bent uh, or bad quality threaded rod. It will work the same. It doesn't matter because you configure the software by telling it what geometry uh, does your uh, threaded rod have? So you, you tell it that it goes up by one millimeter after a certain number of turns and the firmware does the calculation and works with any kind of mechanical setup. You said that this took some, some amount of time to be done. Um, what's actually preventing to be quite fast? Well, th this, this is a, a me medium to little size print. This is uh, actually when we're talking about large prints and talking about things that exceed the 20 usual 20 centimeters area. Uh, I don't know how much time this took, but I think well, two hours, no, no more. One hour, okay. Depends on the speed you set up on your printer. Okay. Yeah, but the question is uh, what, what's actually now prevent it to be fast because I don't think that's the, the gears and the motors and so on. Some, some, something that's actually blocking to be very uh, fast uh, the in five minutes. The, the moving mass of the extruder is still quite heavy. This is the, 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 the uh, so you have inertia. So you have to configure uh, acceleration and deceleration for movements which means that for a single object you will not ever reach the peak speeds because it will start to decelerate before it has reached the, the maximum speed. Uh, for example, the Bowden extruder I showed before, the one with the drive on the frame, it is like the Ultimakers, is it's is much lighter because it only moves the, the final part and they can go faster. Uh, still, we, we cannot print more than 200 millimeters per second. It, it's our top. Uh, you, 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 yeah, yes, you have inertial problems. Vibration. And vibration of the machines and the risk of resonance and uh, actually there is another limit about the how, how much material, how much flow you can, you can melt per second. It's a compromise between extrusion temperature because if you want to push uh, too much material you have a lot uh, of pressure build up inside the extruder. So you would need to increase temperature a lot but then plastic will come out almost liquid. So it's a compromise. But still, it's research. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Okay. Let's make a five-minute break, and then we can continue.